Okay, so let's start now. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you to all the attendees for joining today's webinar. Um, and could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you, Juan. Uh, I'm Simon Rocher. I work for OBO and the Rebellion moderator today. And Joyce want to inform everyone that as we are not attending this webinar, your microphone is mute to avoid background noise. And um, after today's talk, we'll have a question and answer session. Please use the question and answer dedicated window to ask your question during or after the talk. And this webinar is recorded and will be made available on the Capella YouTube channel. Next slide, please. Thanks, Juan. So, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce to today's speaker, Juan Navas. Juan is a system architect with more than 10 years experience on performing and implementing system engineering practices in industrial organizations. He works with system engineering managers and systems architects for implementing model-based systems engineering and product outline engineering approaches in operational projects helping them defining their engineering strategies, objectives, and practices. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Juan. So, Juan, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you, Samuel. Uh, hello, everybody. Yeah, so I'm Juan Navas. I work for uh, Thales Corporate Engineering, which is a Thales uh, unit uh, that defines and deploys engineering practices, process, and tools. And I'm currently leading the uh, model-based systems engineering coaching activity. Um, what I will present today is a presentation that has been made by Stefan Bonnet uh, at the last INCOSI International Workshop at Los Angeles. Uh, but it's also the current result of uh, a 15 years journey on defining model-based systems engineering scope of application, recommended practices and tools, and deploying them in all kinds of projects in Thales. So this slide deck is a compendium of the contributions of many of my colleagues uh, and all the credit goes to them. Before diving into the topic of this talk, I I'm going to start with a short introduction on why model-based systems engineering is important in our projects. As you may know, the complexity of systems never stop increasing. Uh, systems are more and more connected and software is ubiquitous. This complexity is accentu accentuated by the complexity of the industrial organizations that are put in place to develop these systems, which often creates additional interfaces. There is also more stress on our engineering as we are facing new competitors and have shorter time to market. Some disciplines become more and more important nowadays. Just to give you some examples, cybersecurity, big data, artificial intelligence, HAMS, uh, user experience design, and many others. There is, however, one thing that does not really increase is the brain of our engineers. Uh, at least I have seen no proof yet that the younger generation of engineers is significantly more capable than the previous ones. And maybe the engineering brain will be augmented in the future. This is a topic that are, we are currently studying now, but we are not yet there. So complexity of systems, projects and organizations drive to have more people contributing to the success of systems development. And when we put many people work together, well, they are doing more with more constraints and less time. They are coping with very demanding customers. They are interacting with more and more peers. And you see that uh, at the end, uh, there are many communication and information management issues in our engineering process. So when we talk about communication, we need to talk about language. And we see that other disciplines have very well established uh, languages that have been established through, uh, through centuries. For instance, mathematics have reached a common, some kind of common language um, like two or three centuries ago. Uh, construction has common language, they have their own kind of, uh, of uh, drawings that uh, everybody in the construction field can understand. Electronics 
is the case as well, maybe more recently, but is has common language uh, and is evolving, of course, uh, in the years. But even more modern uh, disciplines like software have established languages that are understood by um, by most of the uh, engineers, software engineers. And what about systems engineers? Well, systems engineering have requirements uh, expressed in natural language, some ad hoc spreadsheets, uh, a bunch of visio or PowerPoint diagrams, some traceability, and some tools that are um, managing this traceability. But overall, is is not as formalized as um, as the other disciplines. So if we go back to the INCOSI definition of uh, model-based systems engineering, which is in fact we has has been stated in a document that is called Vision 2020 that was released in 2004, and we are now in 2020. Uh, they state that model-based systems engineering is a formalized application of modeling to support system requirements, design analysis, verification and validation activities, beginning in the conceptual design phase and continuing through the development and later life cycle phases. So there are three important topics to, uh, to highlight here. First, formalized application of modeling. So this is the essence of, uh, of model-based systems engineering. But most importantly is the application of this technique to many, well, I mean, to the system engineering activities and mainly system requirements, system design, system analysis, verification, validation activities, but many others as well. And is to do this uh, all throughout the uh, life cycle of the system, uh, very soon at conceptual design, even before, and uh, of course during design, during development, and even later, maintenance, disposal, life cycle phases. So this presentation is a 360 degree uh, a tour of the Thales implementation of model-based systems engineering. I will first focus on the conceptual background we base our work on and try to explain how it benefits our engineering practices. I will then spend some time explaining how we encourage, implement and monitor the cultural change. So let's start with the fundamentals. And the fundamentals of our uh, model-based systems engineering approach, uh, well, you need solid foundations to build upon. And the basic, basic building blocks of our model-based systems engineering implementation are a method, a language, of course, and a tool. Arcadia is a model-based model -based engineering method. It defines a set of high-level concepts and the associated viewpoints. And Capella is an open source graphical modeling workbench specifically developed to implement the Arcadia method. And it provides the notation and diagrams that are included in Arcadia. So Arcadia and Capella are interdependent. Arcadia has been taught to be implemented in a tool and Capella embeds the Arcadia method. In deploying models in organizations, we could not ignore the backbone of systems engineering practices through the last decades, which is the requirements. Uh, in Arcadia, we complete these requirements with models. We talked about the needs and context model that helps formalize and consolidate customer and other stakeholders, and stakeholder requirements and system requirements. And we also talk about the solution model, which helps validate feasibility, elicit and justify new requirements for system subsystems, among others. If I wanted to summarize the Arcadia method, I would say that there are two orthogonal dimensions. There are five family of concepts, which are the capabilities, functions, components, interfaces, and behavior. We are going, going into the details just after this slide. And there are five different engineering perspectives, which are, there are two perspectives, analysis perspectives that are dedicated to the need and context capture, and three perspectives that are dedicated to the solution description. The five engineering perspectives exploit the same concepts for different purposes. And the color here is not random. Uh, as you will see later in the presentation, bluish is associated to need models, and pink, kind of pink color, is associated to solution models. 
the concepts that we use in Arcadia are not really rocket science. Uh, it all starts with capabilities, which are high-level services provided by the system of interest. Capabilities are described with uh, two concepts that are quite similar in semantic, uh, semantic speaking, uh, which are the functional chains and the scenarios, which both describe how functions work together into fulfilling a uh, capability. Each one of these functional chains or scenarios involve functions, system functions or actor functions, uh, which um, produce and consume functional exchanges. Functional exchanges are implemented by component exchanges and functions are implemented allocated to components. There are of course a link between the component and component exchange, which are the exchanges between the components of the solution. And um, of course the scenario involves components as well. Components participate on interfaces, exchange items uh, are flow inside a functional exchange and these exchange items will define the, uh, the content of uh, the interface. And there is a behavioral description really of modes and states which is related to the components. A component has a mode and states and functions are available in a given or several modes or states of the components or the system as a whole. These are the main concepts of uh, Arcadia, which are illustrated here in this example. So this is an example based on a drone-based uh, system, um, in which there is a capability that is called Visualize Live Data during flight, which is described by five functional chains in this example, which are situation and context of usage of the drone, display display live acquired high definition video, display live multispectral image, display live thermal image, visualize all collected mission data and visualize substance levels in real time. These five functional chains which are description of this capability are involve several functions which are presented in the diagram uh, below. Uh, for instance, the display live acquired high definition video is uh, represented by the blue lines in the in the diagram um, and is involving the is moving object of study function, acquire video function and display mission data in live function. And these three functions work together on into fulfilling the, uh, the capability. Of course, there are the functional exchanges that you see. Uh, all functional exchanges are also involved in this functional chain, uh, but not all functional excha uh, exchanges are involved in this particular functional chain. This uh, slide kind of summarizes the five families of model elements completing, completing requirements. So you see the capability analysis uh, aspect, uh, which uh, mainly involves capabilities, functional chains, and scenarios. The functional analysis, which mainly involves functions and functional exchanges. The behavioral description, which is mainly mode by mode and state machines. A structural description, which are components and component exchanges, and interface description with exchange items and interface, and of course, textual requirements, uh, which are linked to these elements, and we will see it later in this presentation. This slide summarizes our conceptual foundations. Uh, note that in many approaches you don't have all these perspectives and you don't have such a clear separation between need and solution models. You would typically have one, only one stream, functional, logical and physical um, aspects. Even if the conceptual foundations of Arcadia comprise several concepts and analysis perspectives, you will see in a few minutes that you don't have to implement everything and that the scope of the model will strongly depend on the engineering objectives. Of course there is the traceability between these elements and this traceability is supported by the tool which ensures the capability to, uh, to trace uh, elements in the physical and finalized architecture perspectives uh, up, up to the, uh, for instance, the operational analysis perspective which is clearly in the need model uh, perspective. We now have the conceptual background, but what do we do with all this? How do we use these models to leverage our engineering practices? 
In the engineering landscape of artifacts, we typically have requirements on one side and models on the other side. And between them, there are some traceability links which are which may be typed like described, justified, and other kind of things of links. As models rely on a precise language or meta model, they add rigor by significantly reducing ambiguities. Because they obey strict construction rules, models can be automatically processed and analyzed. Among others, this allows to ensure completeness and consistency of design. So if models are more formal and rigorous than requirements, why aren't they considered requirements themselves? A major finding to advance our model-based systems engineering practices is that requirements are at the center of all our engineering activities and requirements can be either textual shall be requirements, either model elements. Textual and model requirements actually complete each other. And then we talk about textual requirements and model requirements instead of model elements. A model element can formalize a textual requirement and explicit its effects and ramifications. So, for instance, in this case, um, we we have a model requirement that go further. That simply the text the textual requirement that is stated here, uh, and explicit the fact that uh, the uh, system will go from the automatic mode to a manual mode, and with all with that. Does that means it meaning all the functions that are involved on each one of these modes and the functions that may be involved in the transition from one mode to another. Some expectations, kind of, re for instance, environmental regulations, these kind of expectations are easier to express with textual requirements, textual descriptions. Uh, they can be still be linked to uh, model elements to uh, make more precise um, the, um, the element uh, of the design that is uh, impacted by this uh, requirement. Some expectations on a model element at a given engineering level do not require a formal modeling which is left to subsystem design. So for instance in this case you see at the left some requirements that are related to a given function, which is a complex function, and clearly it will be uh, refined, uh, probably decomposed, later by other engineering teams that will need to, uh, to study and to analyze the, um, the, the, the findings, the issues that are posed by this, uh, by this requirement. Considering model elements as requirements ha is a game changer and I will illustrate that here with three happy consequences be be among many. First, um, it allows to strengthen the articulation between upstream and downstream engineering. It brings a better mastering of integration, verification and validation activities and it's a real enabler for incremental development strategy and a smoother transition to software. I will start with um, the contracts between engineering level aspects. When we receive customer needs, uh, we will elicitate them uh, in model and textual requirements on the system and we will use the need uh, related perspectives in Arcadia and Capella for this. Then we will elaborate an architecture description uh, we should specify with the adequate level of detail how the system works and what is expected from each component constituent of the system and the objective of this uh, activity is to prepare contracts for all subsystems and guarantee their proper integration. Then the context of a given system constituent is entirely computed thanks to the tools, the, I mean the features offered by Capella tool, anything contributing to the definition of this constituent included, uh, including allocated functions, interfacing component, etc. is, um, is uh, defined in a dedicated need model, which is illustrated in the, uh, in the need uh, box in the, in, the, in the slide. Textual requirements are created when needed in addition to the model requirements. This includes legal, non legal, non-functional, additional specification of internal expected behavior and other kind of textual requirements. 
if we zoom in our example uh, of the drone based system uh, we can consider at the system level that the a tablet is a component of a physical component of our system and at the system engineering level it will be a component and then we can calculate automatically and generate a new model which is focused on the tablet as a system of interest which is the subsystem of interest and maybe another team will focus on this tablet um, tablet need model and go further in the design of this tablet component by defining the tablet constituents and so on through the different levels of uh, engineering and uh, the different um, yeah, different levels of subcontracting. The takeaway of this uh, aspect is that model-based workflows favors co-engineering over the traditional differentiation uh, between customer requirements and system requirements. We go further into the second uh, happy consequences is the integration, verification and validation aspect. Note that some model elements uh, are considered as requirements. Uh, well, the good news is that we can align verification and validation artifacts against the model uh, requirements. Um, Instead of associating test procedures directly to textual uh, requirements, they verify scenarios and functional chains. Each step of a functional chain becomes a step in the test procedure. Verification and validation engineers and system engineers work on a common reference. Hence. Similarly, the alignment between verification and validation campaigns and system increments becomes straightforward. It's easy to precisely, precisely compute the functions, components and interfaces that are necessary for one validation campaign simply by performing queries on the model. This slide is uh, an example of how a major project in Thales has deployed this practice. Their need model was characterized by a set of capabilities and functional chains, which is um, described here at the, at the left side of the of the of this, of this slide. Each capability and functional chain has been associated with a system release. Functional chains have been used as stories or inspiration to write the test procedure. From a given system release, they were able to automatically create and configure the validation campaigns in our own internal verification and validation workbench. They also use the models to improve their findings detection analysis. Um, they start with the test suites and the execution of these test suites and when a finding was found, uh, they, can, they could map this to the, uh, to the NEAT model, the system um, analysis functional chains, involved function, related functional chains, and through the traceability links that have been already been uh, defined through the engineering model-based systems engineering process, they could identify them, could uh, drive an impact analysis identifying the um, the model element, I mean the design element that was uh, at the root cause of this uh, of this finding, and then modify accordingly the solution model uh, elements, functions, and exchanges or textual requirements, uh, and allow the uh, checking of consistency with the specification, and then based on all this information and this uh, consistent information, uh, they could fill the uh, component defects database, the specification defects database, or the comp and the component evolution request. The takeaway of this, um, of this part of the presentation is that model-based workflow favors the co-engineering with integration, verification, and validation teams, securing future test campaigns. The third um, happy consequence is about incremental agile development strategy. Functionally speaking, a system or product can be fully characterized by the sum of all its capabilities and functional chains or scenarios. When doing incremental system development, there is an initial preparation um, planning phase in which the high-level functional chains are dispatched in several uh, system increments. 
The system increments are defined with expected functional content and expected components can be calculated. Um, so we, we see here that a set of model elements based on the uh, functional chains, the blue functional chains in the, in the slide, um, are, have been identified by the system architectural design team and uh, he, they define this and they uh, send this, uh, this model element, this consistent model uh, increment to the subsystem software uh, teams and the uh, VMV, with verification and validation teams at the system level. Uh, they, of course, were involved in defining this, uh, this design through a co-engineering process. In the next uh, iteration, an iteration here is the time during which a system increment is produced, the uh, subsystems teams and the system level verification and validation teams will mo mostly work on the blue, um, I mean the, the, the model element, the design elements that are um, uh, in the blue um, in the blue part of this at uh, the left side of this slide um, they will mostly work on that of course they will perform also co-engineering the next increment uh, meaning the yellow uh, element model elements which are of course again co uh, characterized by the capabilities the functional chains the functions and um, the interfaces and components that are involved into fulfilling uh, this uh, capability, this part of the capability and the, the, this uh, system increment and so on. Uh, the process will, um, will follow until the, um, the end of the development effort. So at this stage, you should be familiar with the concepts like functional chain functions, exchanges, textual requirements. A system increment is um, well has one or many uh, capabilities, which are described by these functional chains, which involve functions and functional exchanges. And requirements are not so very far from this uh, for these model elements because they complete and we work together with these model elements into defining the model and textual requirements that are relevant for a given system increment. The EPIC, uh, a software EPIC is created for each functional chain defined at system level and EPICs are therefore specified with functional chains and textual requirements. Software developers, developers then analyze the EPIC, uh, clearly understand how it fits in the global picture and the value it brings to the final system or product. They split the EPIC in several user stories that are dispatched in several software sprints. Following the, um, the example with the, uh, the drone-based system, uh, we may have a system team, a verification, a validation team, and a software team. The system iteration will be kind of three months iteration, but the software sprint could be a three weeks uh, sprint for the software team. Um, and the, uh, the key element here is that the vision of the high-level capabilities of the product is known and shared by all the teams, not only the system teams, but also the software teams, which really know what they are developing and why they are developing this. Functional chains have been dispatched in several system expected increments in this example. So again, you may imagine that the architectural design team uh, works at the system, uh, the system level, in the green um, I mean the green model, uh, model elements. Um, and at the end of the iteration, the system level iteration, there are data package that is um, provided to the uh, software teams, which will refine uh, these um, these model elements and uh, these functional chains and textual requirements uh, in uh, user stories, which are performed in a more frequent basis, uh, three weeks in this example. And the, um, the verification or validation team will test the components delivered by the control software team uh, at the same time or um, some time after that. 
This uh, example on the methodological approach is described in a paper that will be presented at the INCOSI International Symposium this year, which is called Models as Enablers of Agility in Complex Systems Engineers. So those who plan to be there at the uh, INCOSI International Symposium don't miss this uh, presentation. The main takeaway uh, is that functional chains, as you see, are the new backbone for effective collaboration of in, in uh, engineering. They are the unifying reference, bringing all stakeholders together and making them share a common understanding on wha of what has to be delivered. So at this point you have a better idea of what some of our projects implement and on the practices we try to promote in our company. However, getting teams embrace model-based systems engineering is still a daily challenge and I'll try to give a quick overview of what we, uh, we do to encourage the cultural change. The first thing I'm going to talk about is how we provide perspectives and help engineers understand what they can get from the models. We have identified three categories of contributions of models to the engineering process. The first one is to share. Models can describe and provide a common understanding uh, between uh, engineering teams. Engineering is not necessarily model driven, but models are known by most stakeholders and most importantly by the stakeholders that are involved on the design of the system. The second objective is to secure. Through validation analysis, models are used to guarantee the quality of the engineering data, the consistency, the completeness. Models are part of the engineering base baseline. Several engineering activities are directly related to model, which is the case in the example that we presented before uh, the, in the drone-based system, in which verification and validation activities were based in models, even if they are not performed in, the, uh, in, in Capella tool. The third objective is the automate objective. In this case, models are used to generate engineering artifacts, contractual documents, test cases, software code, uh, software interfaces, hardware design, etc. Models enable tool articulation of engineering acti activities horizontally, meaning between engineering specialities, engineering disciplines, and vertically, meaning between systems, subsystems, hardware, and software teams. More concretely, we have identified 11 areas where models are likely to have added value. The key is to relate what is expected in each engineering activity to what we can get from models. We have worked on a framework um, sorry, on a framework that we can use to give perspectives. For each engineering activity, in this case, for instance, design the architecture or manage variability and reuse, we have identified what the model can bring depending on the targeted objective. This framework helps our coaches and, or of course, our design teams uh, conduct their frame, framing, framing sessions in the beginning of, of projects and, of course, in the beginning of model-based systems engineering deployment. When we uh, identified the contribution of models to the improvement of engineering practices and on the priorities of engineering teams, we are able to infer a modeling plan that will state how the Arcadia perspective and concept will be used to reach the engineering objective. For instance, we could say that we will first focus on the needs and solutions functional content, which is mostly the blue uh, zone in this, uh, in this uh, slide. And then, once it, the functional um, aspect is secured, uh, we will focus on the detailed characterization of interfaces and in particular in at the physical architecture, the finalized architecture perspective. So this is just an example, but there are many uh, possibilities here and it really depends uh, it's specific to the needs of the projects or on the products we work with. With the conceptual foundations and the engineering objective framework, we have a pretty good toolbox, but there is a lot we can do, uh, we have to do in some cases, as an organization to support the deployment of model-based systems engineering. There are 
three core enablers uh, that really necessary to ensure deployment. First, constant and renewed commitment from the management, top management I'm talking here, the strong motivation and resilience of a network of highly skilled individuals who work together on a common goal, and sizable mentoring coaching force. There are some mantras, meaning a lot of demystification job to be done. Uh, here's some examples that of what we hear on a daily basis. Uh, we don't need model-based systems engineering, we are delivering and we have been delivering for the last 30 years without model-based systems engineering. Delivering is different from being competitive and our goal is to be competitive, to increase our quality and engineering performance. We also hear that VCO diagrams are enough. Uh, they do the job and uh, they look nicer. But visio diagrams are not enough. Uh, you need more rigor, especially when you work on cl complex system design. We also hear that this is too big of a change uh, for an added value that is difficult to perceive. Uh, well, we have learned from David Long <laughs> that uh, we don't need to seek the big bang. We need to focus on specifics and the uh, engineering framework, the engineering objectives framework allow us to really identify what is needed uh, by, the, uh, by the project team, by the systems engineering team uh, with regards to the needs of the, of the project and the needs and uh, the expectations of, uh, of our customers and what are the modeling activities that really add value uh, to the project. Uh, we also hear that there are too many possible ways to do a model-based systems engineering. It's impossible to know uh, where to start. Well, in this case, we really need to manage and monitor our modeling activities. For instance, defining a modeling plan that is in uh, synchronized with the needs uh, of the project. And, of course, get help. Uh, from the uh, the coaches in our company and from the support in our business units. We also have a community which is not called MBSC but MSB. Uh, S is from m simulation, so it's a modeling and simulation community. Uh, it regroups hundreds of Thales engineers. It releases newsletters sharing experiences from business units and abroad. It includes forums frequently asked questions sections and it's key to communicate to advert and advertise our success stories which is an important uh, part of uh, change management and cultural change. We also have Thales Capella Days which are uh, average, have an average of a hundred participants in, uh, in a single place, uh, some participants uh, in uh, remote. Um, it uh, has giant tutorials uh, operational feedback sessions and more generally it allows to uh, to do some networking at user level which is uh, very important uh, in engineering as well. Um, we have defined some transformation services, dedicated model-based systems engineering transformation services, which include awareness raising on model-based systems engineering, definition of the modeling strategy, implementation guidance and assistance, and peer reviews, meaning reviews of the uh, model base design. Uh, thinking, for instance, in a major preparing a major mi milestone in the project. We also have a network of coaches, uh, which currently has uh, 30 members. Uh, it regroups some, I mean, the finest experts on model-based systems engineering in our company and in several, not only at the corporate engineering level, but also at the uh, business unit uh, level. So these are, uh, they were working on coaching toolboxes, the objective framework, the sample models, and investigating some advanced topics, and of course, sharing uh, coaching practices, sharing uh, experiences uh, from uh, from the uh, each one of the um, the business units. Talking about the resources, uh, well, some of the resources are internal, but there are a lot of resources that are external and available to you. Uh, so first of all, you know maybe already but there is our Capella website where you will find a lot of things, a lot of learning material, industrial case studies, uh, the links to the public public forum, YouTube channel 
and this webinar will be included in the uh, in the YouTube channel. YouTube channel, a free download of uh, Capella, of course, but a lot of add-ons as um, and and many more. So I won't go into these uh, details, but I let you go to this uh, to this uh, to the website to to get more information. And um, I think that's all. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm open to questions from you. Okay, thanks everyone for your presentation and for sharing some insight with us. And indeed, yes, it's time for, for questions. Um, actually, we, we, we have two questions in, in the Q&A uh, uh, window. Uh, I'm sure that many of you would have uh, additional ones, so I invite you to, to ask your question using this, uh, this window. So first question is from John Erasmus. Uh, why did the previous slide show on port no closure analysis lever? I thought ports are only defined from system analysis onwards. Uh, yeah, I don't remember which uh, slide. Uh, is, yeah. Is, is, I, yeah, that's my to, problem uh, too. Yeah, we need to go to the uh, to the uh, to the previous uh, uh, slide and to know what is, what is the specific slide. Uh, what 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 will be uh, I think relevant in this uh, aspect is that in operational analysis perspective, even if you can't create, um, uh, I mean ports as you will do. Uh, you, you would do in other perspectives. Uh, you can create physical links, uh, which are, in fact are not physical links, but communication uh, links uh, between uh, operational entities. So in some cases, uh, because of constraints of the uh, context of operation and uh, how things, for instance, in a modernization project, you, there are a lot of things that exist already and are, certainly won't change uh, in, in the future. Um, you may want to uh, add some uh, aspects uh, of the physical, I mean, logical and physical perspectives from the operational analysis perspective. So, um, yeah. Okay, next question. Are the textual requirements managed within the tool? Can those be linked to requirement management tools? If so, which tools are supported? Yeah, so um, uh, these textual requirements are in the in the slides that I presented. They were represented by these purple boxes. Um, so they are uh, textual requirements and uh, there is an add-on uh, that is um, available for everybody to import uh, requirements from a format that is called Recif. Uh, so it's an XML-based format, uh, and you can import these uh, these requirements from uh, I mean from any tool that uh, that will um, that will be able to export uh, a Recif format. Of course, these tools sometimes they export this format in a specific way. So in some cases, we have seen that for for some tools there are some small tweaks to do uh, in the way that these tools uh, export the Recif file. Uh, we use a specific uh, tool in our company. A uh, very well-known tool in requirements uh, management, um, and it works very well. Uh, there are other tools that have been tested, so we need to know which test, which tool we are talking about. Uh, provided you, uh, the tool uh, is able to export the uh, Recif format, uh, is probably uh, supported by this add-on. Yeah, and um, I will just complete the answer. You can also consider to look at the SMW for system modeling work which by cement with basically is the integration of team center and and Capella, which is a commercial tool um, that could also cover cover this thing. Um, okay okay next question have you considered implementing Arcadia method in SizeML instead of creating Capella tool? Uh, yeah, the the answer is yes. Uh, I I wasn't here <laughs> when it was done because it was in the beginning of the journey. I would say uh, in the uh, 2006 2007, uh, there were several studies uh, on uh, on using the SizeML language uh, to support the uh, engineering uh, the engineering method, the engineering process. Um, the decision was made to to create a tool that is that simplifies a lot of things related to to SizeML, even if if 
you see some of the diagrams in Capella, there are a lot of diagrams, I mean many diagrams, which are quite similar to the diagrams in SizeML. For instance, the modern state machines are quite similar, the sequence diagrams are quite similar, but there are also many major differences between uh, the Capella notation and the Capella, I would say, language, Arcadian Capella language, and the SizeML language. Um, I could go further on that, but I think the best thing to do is to go to the website. Uh, there is a dedicated page on uh, SizeML and Arcadia, comparing SizeML and Arcadia Capella language. Yes, and we also had a, a, a webinar focused on the differences uh, between Capella and SizeML, uh, which highlights the reason why Capella has decided to, to create Capella. And this webinar is available on the YouTube channel. Um, what about modeling the organization once the system is all ready? Um, I'm not sure I fully under. I mean, I can understand the question in many ways. <laughs> uh, yep. About modeling the organization? No, I, okay. Yeah, I mean, what I suggest is that maybe, Aaron, you could try to uh, rephrase your, your question and we will. We, we, Try to answer a bit later. So, so, so next next question. Uh, would you please explain the difference between model and tool? The model is the representation. It's an abstraction of the the system of interest. I mean, it's, the system could be uh, anything. In our case, we use uh, Arcadia and Capella for uh, I will human made uh, systems uh, and products that will be uh, will be used by uh, some organizations, uh, mostly electronic software, hardware products. Uh, but the system could be an anything, uh, in fact. And uh, the model will be, will always be an abstraction uh, of this, um, of this uh, system of interest. The tool is the, um, well, the tool is a software tool, and Capella is a software tool that will allow you to design the system and design the model the different views on the model of the system. Okay, thanks. And sorry for the link form. Um, can you disclose the list of your 11 engineering activities? Yeah, well, it's a short answer, no. Uh, this is the, um, I mean, this is part of the, um, the, the experts' uh, toolbox. Uh, and this is the kind of tools that we use when we uh, we coach uh, teams inside and outside uh, Thales. Uh, so yeah, no, you cannot. At least not in the webinar. Um, you have shown all Arcadia supports functional requirements uh, with a strong software focus. I'm not sure about this statement, but anyway, uh, can you tell us how Arcadia supports non-functional requirements, uh, performance, security, cost, uh, and so on, which are crucial for systems engineering? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, indeed, um, Capella, Arcadia and Capella has a, has a functional focus. Um, in the way that it uh, focuses on some concepts like capabilities or functional chains or scenarios which are really, I mean, kind of functional, uh, describing functional aspects of the system. But um, we have also, uh, I mean, there are several ways to handle this non-functional requirements. Uh, first of all, they can be, I mean, through the uh, the links between the textual requirements and the model and how these textual requirements and model requirements work together, uh, we can create, uh, we can justify how the design, meaning the model design, model-based design, uh, fulfills these, uh, these textual uh, requirements, which can be non-functional requirements. This will be the first one. Uh, the second one is the possibility to, uh, to add um, um, domain 
domain specific properties so you talked about security or uh, safety or performance so you can add uh, using uh, some of the add-ons and the property value management tool uh, add-on uh, you can add uh, domain specific properties to your model elements to make sure that uh, the specifications uh, that you will provide to subcontractors or that uh, to um, uh, to other engineering teams uh, really uh, include the non-functional uh, aspects of the design and the third solution uh, you can also extend the Capella tool to um, create more uh, dedicated analysis perspective or analysis tools uh, for each one of these non-functional aspects. So there are some extensions for instance for uh, mass uh, analysis, uh, for cost analysis, for performance analysis based on functional chains and there are many others uh, that has been done. I mean these three are, are free to use, to test, or more like prototypes, but in our company there are several uh, extensions uh, that are, have been made to um, to uh, consider these non-functional aspects in uh, the model-based design. Uh, thanks Juan. Um, okay, some questions because we already answered them. Um, are the programmatic elements uh, included in the meta model, for instance uh, the increments? What is the primary? What is the primary reference for the future meta model description? Yeah, this uh, I I'm I'm guess I'm talking. We are talking about the third uh, happy consequences. Uh, happy consequence regarding the incremental. Uh, the, I mean the how models support how models support the incremental uh, development. Uh, these um, increments, these releases. Uh, can be included in the model and of course related to model elements. Uh, this is mostly an internal uh, add-on that we have in, in, in our company, an extension to, to Capella. Uh, this is one example of what I was talking just before, um, in which uh, releases of system releases and information about system releases and the links between the system release and the model elements are defined in the tool. Uh, and can be uh, provided, exported to uh, to other uh, engineering teams. Okay, about verification and validation, uh, what kind of properties are verified in your use cases? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot. Uh, there, there are so many. I don't know if it, the uh, Fayez are he's talking about something in particular, uh, but uh, of course there could be performance aspects, security aspects, safety aspects. Uh, I mean there are many. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, and the system is ready. Uh, the organization is going to use it for many scenarios, um, for processes. A uh, detailed understanding of the operational processes before starting anything may help to understand requirements. Yeah. Um, I, okay, this is your answer. <laughs> I don't know if there is a question, but uh, I, I would say well, I would say yes, <laughs> and uh, okay. I will I will add uh, some information. I would say that um, in in some cases when we have worked with uh, some teams that needed to um, to work together with their clients. Uh, to the risk to really understand the, uh, the 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 company processes, the operational processes of the customer, uh, they worked on uh, really with them, uh, and they worked a lot on the operational analysis perspective in Arcadia. So meaning they did workshops with the customers to uh, reach a common understanding of what these operational processes were, which operational processes, what they they are made of, which activities are related, and the con main constraints on these operational processes. And of course, it really indeed uh, added to better um, define the system of interest, the system that would be provided to the customer and the requirements that this system uh, uh, would uh, would fulfill. Okay, next question. Which is the question, this one? Uh, how do you see the possibility in the future to get rid of textual requirements and only use models and requirements? Um, well, this is like the, I would say, the growl, <laughs> the, um, the long-term vision of models 
uh, that has been stated from like a, from more than a decade um, is certainly a target. It could be a target. Uh, today and in the near future, uh, we really insist on having text store requirements and model requirements working together uh, because there are a lot of things that could ex be expressed with models, but current technologies on current ways of current ways of working and all the um, I would say the cultural background of uh, systems engineering uh, doesn't allow us to have to only. Uh, all these uh, aspects represented in models uh, and of course they are more easily uh, expressed uh, using um, using uh, textual requirements so uh, the short and midterm really this is the the, um, the approach that we are following uh, and uh, th the long-term vision is still there having uh, full models Okay, and the second part of the message was an invitation for the next week. Yeah, uh, so thank uh, you. Just to check you, <laughs> you saw it. Uh, okay, and uh, last question. Uh, do you have an API for Capella? And I can okay easily answer yes uh, to this question. Uh, there is an open API, and the, the whole code is, uh, is uh, open source, so it's quite easy to so we try to extend, extend it and so on. Okay, so uh, I don't know if some of you may have, have some other questions, but we are running out of time. So thanks again for attending today. Uh, maybe one, can you can you go to yes next slides? Um, I just want to. Uh, uh, I like the fact that we, we, we are able to announce the next webinar, which is not so common. Um, uh, it will be held on Sunday 26th of March at 5 p.m. Central East Time. And Scott Millsap for Connex Merchant uh, will give a presentation on, let me check exactly the title, uh, experiences with collaborative system architecture development within a joint venture organizations. So pretty much a case study oriented webinar in the automotive and autonomous driving domain. So once again, I would like to thank you all for attending this webinar and please feel free to contact us if you want to learn more and I will wish you all uh, a very nice evening. Thank you.